we were having this one discussion on Wittgenstein, and it had it had sort of. Yeah. And he, could, he could produce a course that had a syllabus that had specific outcomes. Trigger warnings. Trigger warnings. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I did it. And if I could do it, he, uh, he, I, used to, I used to write up all these state syllabi. I wouldn't have to really inquire. <laughs> didn't pay that okay. And, uh, and, so, in other words, you and, and no one knew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is, which is, which is, which is, just to speak to that a little bit, uh, it was a I can't remember whether it was in a larger session or just in a, uh, it's like a side comment, and maybe over a meal. Bruce Lawrence was talking about uh, what things are like at Duke now, mm -hmm. and specifically, and especially at, at uh, Divinity School. But, but. Uh, I, yeah, I didn't know anything about that. Well, what I took from that discussion is that, is that uh, uh, things are very much more restricted. Poteet would have a really hard time, uh, not in terms of the imposition of yeah. uh, like, uh, having objectives and, and all well, that. That's not that what I'm talking about. But, but the, the narrowness of, of uh, certainly in the Divinity School, of, of theological perspective now compared to what it was like then, there was a lot more latitude that Poteet had. And I think one, one of the points made earlier is that is that um, Poteet liked being where he was. I think it was Bruce's yeah. point. Really liked being where he was because he could do what he could do. Right. But I think that was due in part to the contingencies of history and that institution at that time and the other personalities present. And, and with the different personalities, he would have right now, I at least seem to be from what Bruce was saying, a much, much harder time. Maybe he couldn't. Because of the administration out? Uh, well, I mean, he would have to produce a syllabus outcome, how you measure that outcome, how you're going to test your success in that outcome. I mean, all these things. Is that are, unique to Duke now, or is that no, 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 you mentioned Elizabeth Clark was denied you know, a course she had taught forever. You know, so I could see them you know, saying, no, you're not going to teach that course anymore. Yeah. Yeah, especially be able to teach whatever he wanted. I mean, he wouldn't have that free yeah. right now. Yeah. Even with tenure, that doesn't give you freedom? Well, it sounded like right now you wouldn't get tenure. That's but even I, I, I'm, I'm writing on Bruce's characterization. Yeah. <laughs> This is all, you know, this is all speculation. The thing that strikes me about Bill Petit is he, he carried his own authority. I mean, he authorized himself. And, you know, authority is, you know, sometimes we think about the authority is always from the outside. But that's not true. You know, we've all met people who authorize their presence and people recognize that authority, and he had them. And, you know, whatever system he's in, I think he's still going to have the... Now, there's different struggles, different pushes and pulls, but I I don't know, I think he... I can't imagine him not driving wherever he was <laughs> myself, but I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. But if there I were uh, feelings of uh, misgivings among colleagues, how did he ever get to be chairman of the department? Yeah. Well, just, yeah. Process of elimination? Well, <laughs> I don't know. The we one were, one we were long gone from Duke yeah. at that yeah. point. I, 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 can, I can help with that because I was a student committee. Uh, I was a student member on the committee that was assigned to find a chair <laughs> uh, as a graduate student. And Bill, uh, who had only recently moved into the Department of Religion, was asked to be chair of that committee. And that committee met twice, and they got together and said, this is our, we were supposed to find an outside chair. Oh. And they said, let's go to the administration and ask Bill to be the chair. But I, I really, 
No, no. And, I, and Adam Ben may know whether how he reacted to the idea originally, uh, but uh, he, uh, I mean, they prevailed on him. Uh, and they, you know there were it was a you know a time of some uh, uh, tension and concern, but they they were just uh, overwhelmed by his ability to. This is my reading, uh, you know, to conduct the affairs of that. They yeah. they knew this guy could lead them, but I don't think some of them really knew him before that. Mm. So it was like getting stoned from outside anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you know that goes to all of this uh, that we've heard about. Uh, uh, I think uh, Osborne's view and Bruce's view, and whether uh, Bill was. Uh, I mean, he uh, he would open his graduate seminars in in my years by saying, "I'm happy to pay uh, collect call for long distances." Mm -hmm. to not have to live in Durham and for the privilege of living in Chapel Hill. Well, you know, a lot of people at Duke weren't real happy about that kind of attitude. And there were, there were faculty members who would ask us, what is, what is Poteet doing? Mm -hmm. uh, so he, uh, but I think once he was chair, uh, I, I know, like he, he mentored uh, McCullough and helped him, you know, with that book. And I, I think that, that, that they got to know him Better. At least that's my read on it. But did, did he want to be chair? You think, Ben? Uh, nah, yes and no. I, he was always tempted. I, I think I was telling somebody this afternoon. I think he had at least three offers to be president of a college or university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, when he and I talked about it, I'm sure he talked to a lot of people. But uh, he, one of the extraordinary things about him uh, was. Well, I guess his own language. You know, he, he was so grounded in what he did and so aware of his own strengths in doing it mm -hmm. that he didn't have a lot of temptations professionally. Mm -hmm. And that's why it never bothered him not to show up or to not rise to the level of his colleagues' expectations about the ordinary structures and strictures. And uh, we were talking this afternoon, just reminiscing. And uh, <laughs> it's very funny, he, he just ignored a lot of stuff that was required. He just simply ignored it. And we benefited from a lot of it. Yeah. Like what would that, like what? Well, should I tell them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can't do anything. They can't do anything. <laughs> they can't do fire <laughs> Uh, he called me in his office one day, uh, and we were, I mean, you've never seen such an organized effort. Uh, I don't know who is it, we three, and Milton, and I don't know, maybe somebody, Jerry, Jerry some, before. We decided, we were through with our coursework, we were getting ready for oral exams, for, I mean, for written exams, and then orals, et cetera, et cetera. We met every week and went through every book we'd ever read, outlined it, went through it, Bill's perspective, our perspective. I mean, it was a really enriching experience. Yeah. We got to the end of all that, and Bill called me in his office, and he said, Ben, said, uh, I really impressed, he didn't know we were even doing that. He said, I'm impressed y'all doing things, been great students, you know all this stuff. Uh, there will be no preliminary exams. <laughs> so go tell the coast of Nostra, uh, everything's fine. And I remember standing on the steps of Duke Chapel, I said, hey, animals, over here. <laughs> no exam. Yeah. And we didn't cry. We said, yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if you'd had to say, now, yeah. wait a minute, Professor Porti, uh, I don't know what he handed in. We probably all got, you know, excellent something. <laughs> or something. I don't know. What he, but he had no compunction. Yeah. about simply ignoring the strictures of the academy. <laughs> it was none. I mean, it wasn't a moral issue. It was nothing. He knew us. We knew him, et cetera, et cetera. And he knew now, what we knew and didn't know. Oh, a well, lot, yeah. yeah. But uh, um, to speak to your question, Gus, he repeatedly, I mean, it was not unusual for him to walk in a room and leave everybody right. like that, you know, including search committees, et cetera, et cetera. And my first job 
they offered it to him. And he said, no, but do hire Ben. I mean, it was that kind of thing. I mean, he just, uh, you know, he had this way of saying, I know where I am, I know what I do, and basically, I fell out of the operating table at birth being a teacher. That's, that's what he did. I mean, he didn't, and he didn't even have to think about it. He just oozed teaching, that's what he did. And so the idea of being a president was tempting. One in particular in, in Virginia, he came very close and they begged him and blah, blah, blah. And he came back and said, that's just not what I do, you know. And so by the time he became head of the department in, at Duke, first of all, he had a love-hate relation to Duke in general. You know, he, that was not, if you said, how would you design a university that was compatible with your sensibilities and aspirations, hmm. he wouldn't say, oh, Duke. You know, <laughs> yeah. he, he, that, that's not where it came out. And so you got to realize that was not, in a lot of ways, he'd wake up on Wednesdays and say, damn, Duke, you know. Uh, on the other hand, in contrast, I would say to Osborne, the only thing I read that Osborne wrote that I thought was totally unencumbered by the truth was uh, the fact that he cared very deeply about his colleagues in the same way he cared about his students, but he was not focused on them because he assumed as colleagues they were very good at what they did. But to take on the bureaucracy of Duke and be the transmitter and indeed absorb the blows from the dean, the provost, you know, and that was really not his bag, you know, and never would be. And uh, I don't say I it has nothing to do with. I don't think he was very good at it in that way, as I know administration. Uh, he didn't spend a lot of time thinking about. You know, knew, he, he did things instinctively and he commanded such a towering respect and even fear from people who didn't know him. But I don't think he spent a lot of time moving the department, you know, toward a certain kind of vision of uh, institutional stability or progress or all these things we talked about. Apart from the Chuck Long point. Well, that was an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Chuck was the very first person uh, to be jointly appointed, and Rule and I and he used to meet in my house out in the woods uh, near between Chapel Hill and Greensboro uh, many nights trying to persuade Chuck, and, and then Chuck would come and we'd figure all this stuff out. Having my role was very small, but, but we just happened to be heads at the time, and uh, when that happened, it was a signal event uh, because Duke and Chapel Hill were so at logger and so jealous and so prohibitive of interchange and you know, all that crap. And uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful appointment, no, no question about it. And he and Rule did it in that sense, yeah. But, you know, doing that is, is one thing. Running a department is yeah. another thing, mm -hmm. and uh, Chuck was so uh, attracted to both Rule and Bill at that time that that was, in a way, the easy part of saying I'm the representative of the department. But he was actually Bill Petit, you know, and uh, that's almost irresistible in that at that level, you know, for a Chuck. Mm -hmm. Did Bill keep uh, up? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. I wanted to sort of add a compliment to what has been presented so far, but at least what uh, I experience uh, calls for putting in a few more things in, in the picture that's been developed so far. Uh, there's no mention so far of how, and this is, this is stated in print by Rule Tyson, among other things, but certainly by me and things I've written too, Poteet was a consummate uh, Socratic dialectician. They don't come any better. Uh, and, and Rule Tyson says, I've never known anyone in my entire career who was able to sustain it as long in, in, a, in as qualitatively high a way as Poteet is. Now what does that mean in this connection? Well, at least as I interpret it, one aspect of it is that, is that he was principally, at least in the years that I was there, in the, in the late 60s, 
uh, with, with his graduate classes. He drew out student ideas, just as Socrates was this midwife of his interlocutor's ideas. He would draw them out in such a way, well, it, Socrates is portrayed in some of Plato's dialogues as not only doing this, but he, he would withdraw, <coughs> draw out, so bring to birth these intellectual children of other people and see if they're vital, <coughs> alive, or dead. <laughs> Throw them out, separate them from the person that gave them birth if they, there wasn't any decent quality to them. Uh, in, in Socrates' case, they were always dead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Ways. I'm not entirely sure of that. But anyway, so many, said, yeah. so just, but, wow. but uh, the so-called elenchus uh, that, that is attributed to Socrates is, is bringing that out and sort of, uh, but, but bringing out that, that indeed they are, they're lifeless. But uh, Potit drew out ideas so well and so skillfully. Uh, I, I marveled at this at the time, not only with myself, but with others. When he'd come out and he would empathetically articulate those ideas and bring them to expression. So, and, and you could not tell, at least the person in question could not tell, is this me? Is this right. Poti? <laughs> uh, and and uh, we left with the question after a full hour or more of discussion of this sort of thing. Uh, uh, well, what does Poti believe about this? <laughs> And, and that's part of Poteet's irony, and as he himself put it. Uh, this is in the Wikipedia article I have quoted. Um, as a practicing dialectician, I have learned one must adopt an attitude of irony in order to understand and elucidate conflicting points of view. What therefore is important is not where I stand on a given moment, at a given moment, but where I stand at the end, Me meaning that he withholds, though he was present in lots of ways, he withheld a lot of himself in a way that, at least in my years there, you didn't know where he was at on a particular issue. But uh, in terms of support for the person, no question. His being present and encouraging to the person, no question. Although sometimes it could be a little <laughs> uh, wacky. wacky. <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, a little blunt uh, and, and crude even sometimes, but it would always be supportive, nevertheless. Uh, so that, that's an important additional complement to what's already said that was there throughout at least my experience of OT graduate teaching. I remember him being quite deaf at, uh, it's automatically closing windows here. Uh, at, at quite what? I remember quite definitely at the beginning of these graduate courses, more in the way of assignments than was actually expressed here earlier. I remember that he would say, we're going to do something like three or four papers this term. You're each going to do that. They're going to be this long. No, I was talking about that. I was just talking about the, the reading assignments. That yeah. Well, anyway, they, 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 were, they were writing assignments. Yes. Uh, and they were a definite length he's looking for, yes. and in my experience there were like three to four pages, something on that order, uh, I can't remember exactly, uh, and uh, uh, he said, I want you to go for the jugular. Uh, you, you may want to spend a lot of time going, building up to that, giving justification for it, I don't want any of that, none of the, the usual accoutrements of scholarship, I want you to go for the jugular, and, and, and uh, get at the heart of it and uh, either criticize it or articulate it, whatever, but to, to bring it to focus. And uh, that was something I never had experienced before and I couldn't have done in another context. I couldn't have experienced in another graduate context, but I did there. And uh, that was really important, I think. Uh, just a couple further things about that. Uh, he graded all the papers and he commented extensively mm -hmm. every paper that I wrote. So it wasn't like just free for all and nothing happened. A lot was happening in that sense, that, that kind of interchange. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of reading assignments, I don't remember exactly how we presented them, but uh, I had a pretty clear idea as I went from week to week that we were going to cover this material. Mm -hmm. and, and so we needed to have read this by this. It was never onerous. It was never a huge amount. 
but, but often it was quite definite. The neo existentialism course, I know we, one, of the course, one of the books we read early on was Sartre's Transcendence of the Ego, and uh, uh, either or, and... Uh, Ortega. Ortega, yeah, ego sets, yeah, mm. man and people or something right. like that. Uh, so so we, we definitely did read selected books and over a certain course of period of time. And, and uh, often it wasn't just we could write on whatever we wanted to. Sometimes it would say, I'd like you to write on this book uh, and, and, or make a presentation on this. And then that would kick off the discussion. But like it was represented earlier, in my memory at least, it was whatever the student said, usually in a paper, sometimes it was just in a comment in the class, he would use that as an occasion to draw you out. And almost inevitably, it was seeking, just like he sought in some of the texts we were reading, he was seeking places at which there was a, uh, an ironic contradiction between what you were articulating and what you were <laughs> beneath the surface. Uh, and, and bringing that out, bringing that to life. Uh, so it wasn't a T group, it wasn't summary elements.